All right. Welcome to 2 p.m. and the penultimate track to talk. Uh, Ian Meyer, sustainable fisheries, preventing disease in farm raised fishing, farm raised fishing. Ian is the associate director of security assurance for a multi-billion dollar global resort company whose name you are going to have to guess. When not working with large enterprises, he can be found at Full Sail University teaching the next generation about InfoSec and risk, risk management as a course director in the IT and cybersecurity programs. He's also the president of B-Sides Orlando and mentoring co-lead for the Diana Initiative. Uh, he runs workshops. He's been running advanced cubicles and compromises here, um, tabletop incident response workshop. Uh, in 2019, he competed in the social engineering capture the flag at DEF CON 27. And not only did he compete, only four other people beat him. I like that. I like the way you did that. That's nice. <laughs> thank you for being here, Ian. It's all yours. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Wildwest Hackathon. Thank you for those attending. Thank you for those online over there, my, my camera folks. Uh, as uh, BB said, I am Ian Meyer, and we're going to talk about sustainable fisheries today. And I even changed the subtitle here a little bit uh, to, to break it into conservation instead of poaching. So if any of you fish or hunt or things like that, uh, I, I don't actually, but I love the terminology as we think about it. And we're going to discuss how conservation of our fish is much more important than the gotchas in getting people to actually click on the link. So uh, you've already heard plenty about me, uh, most of which BB went over, but the reason I include this slide in the deck is because when you get back to your jobs, to your schools, to whatever you're doing, and you say, oh, this guy, he had a fishing pole and he did this stuff and, and we should do this too. And they go, that sounds crazy. That sounds like somebody who swings around nunchucks in a professional photo. You can say, yes, but he's also got these credentials and works at pretty large companies and has found some moderate success in doing this. So uh, I, I do actually have up there uh, where I work, but it's Marriott Vacations Worldwide. We're the resort and timeshare wing that spun off of Marriott uh, before they had their major breach. And I, I love to include that, not because we're at a security conference like, oh, this guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Their company got breached. The reason I include it is one, because everyone here needs to understand companies survive breaches. It's not like they have a breach and they go, well, I guess burn it all down. Um, and second, if you get the opportunity to work at a company that shares the same board as another multi-billion dollar company that had a major breach and join them as they're saying, how do we prevent this? As Ferris Bueller said, it's very choice. I highly recommend it. Um, so. I'm not going to talk anymore about me, but I do want to say thank you again. And if you're in here and want the slides because you, you, you want them up closer to read, you want to take them with you, they are up now. They are in the Discord. You can use that bit.ly link. It will take you to my Google Drive. If later I update anything, I will put it in that Google Drive folder. So if someone says, hey, you've got a typo there where you, you know, call the... Oh, Ed, what are you doing to me? Go ahead. So it's a fishing pocket. <laughs> I was waiting for that. I, I assure you on, on pain of John Strand putting a boot all the way inside my rectum that that is not a fishing link. Uh, <laughs> first off, the fact that it's spelled correctly, I assure you, is purely by accident. Um, so you can grab the slide there now. It's in Discord as well. So let's talk about ethical fisheries, right? I did a talk for Wild West Hack and Fest for Deadwood when it was virtual, and I highly recommend that you go check that talk out because it covers a lot of things that we're going to glance over. Again, you can use this QR code. It will take you to it. Don't watch it now, uh, but you know, watch it later. We talk about the need to do fishing exercises in a much more ethical way and how we can do that. But today, I want to talk to you about sustainable fisheries, right? So you'll notice I got the PHF fishery and whatnot, but when we think about fish in the ocean and we go out and we want fish, we want salmon, we want all this stuff. And when we overfish, we ruin the population. We send these boats out and they trawl and they pick up all this stuff. Now, it is not difficult to take a giant net and run it through the ocean and grab everything there. The fish has never seen a net. They've never been on a carnival cruise. They don't know what a boat is. They're going to get caught, right? And the fishermen are like, yes, we caught a bunch of fish. 
And you know what? Truthfully, they did. And that was their goal. But the outcome of catching all those fish with a very easy, giantly scalable method is going to ruin that population. It's going to take those fish out of the ocean. It's going to make them so that you can no longer fish them. You know, we've heard conservationists and ecologists and oceanographers and all kinds of academics talk about there are species of fish that your children and grandchildren just might not be able to eat. Now, why am I talking about all this, right? Why am I going into all the stuff about fishing and, and whatnot? Because here's the thing. Sustainable fishing, what, well, what does it have to do with sustainable fishing, I should say? We have what I like to call the fishing industrial complex. We're, we're in a military town, so we've heard the terms military industrial complex, but what is it? You've got big companies that sell services for fishing, and they make it super, super, super easy for you to go to your organization, to the people you're charged to protect, click on a link and send out an email and say, oh, look at all the people that we clicked and look at all the education we delivered. But what do those campaigns do? If they click in that fishing exercise and they click on that bait, we get the fish, but what's the outcome? Do we build... Do we, do we build a better program? Do we build a better farming exercise? Do we build uh, a better way to protect our organization to kind of start blending out of the, uh, the fishing scenario and into the fishing scenario? The fish should be treated as a valuable resource. Now, you might be wondering, what do I mean by the fish? Now, a lot of people say, oh, you caught a fish. You caught that email. You clicked on the email. But I'm thinking of this about the users we're charged with protecting because in the end, they are what provide value, not you, not your, hey, look, I got you to click on a link. That's not what provides value to the organization. The people doing the work do, that go out and say, oh, they're selling whatever product or service it is you have. They're delivering that product or service in a way that the clients want it. They generate money. We've heard this theme in several talks. Doc opened the conference with it saying, you don't as security, actually, no company is in the business of being the most secure company in the world. Like, well, uh, we make money by being secure. Okay, how? Well, by being secure. But how? Nobody does that. They make money by doing things. And your job in security is to protect the people that deliver the job and their clients. That's your job, right? So we need to perform conservation efforts or this resource will disappear, right? People will go to other companies where they're not treated like pandemic, uh, pan, uh, pandantic children. I almost said pandemic, and I'm like, also true, but where they're not treated like children, where the security team partners with them to say, I'm here to enable you. I'm here to be a force multiplier. I'm here to make it so that you can do your job without some criminal interrupting it. We need to do better. So I'm going to talk about some uncomfortable truths. Is everyone ready for an uncomfortable truth? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So for those of you who did not respond, all you need to do, take your fingers, put them in your ears and go, oh, risk acceptance, big four, blah, blah, blah. They gave us a report. We're going to just do that for a while. <laughs> and I will let you know when it's safe to come back by making a reference to the classic movie Hackers, because I am legally obligated to make at least one conference talk. It's just the way it works. So we're ready. So for those of you fingers and ears, everybody else, fishing is easy. That's why it works. That's why criminals do it. It's not hard. You're not super elite by sending a phishing email and getting somebody to click on it. I'm not saying that it's not a skill, just like taking a cane pole out into a, into a river or into a lake and catching a fish isn't a skill, but it's not a hard skill to learn, right? Getting end users to click is not elite. Maintaining a population of healthy fish is hard. Making sure that the people that you're charged with protecting are actually protected and that you're testing your controls for how phishing or phishing emails get into your environment, that is hard. Doing it without the fish feeling the hook going into their mouth and getting ripped out of the water, flopping around on the ground and say, what was that as they get thrown back in? 
that's hard. So we've got also required to have some memes. I think this is the first set, then I'll have a second set. Again, I'm of a certain age where you're required to have memes. There are people that do better slides than I do. I apologize. But here's us as InfoSec, right? We go through and we get, we get our, our big fishing tool and whatnot. And we say, fishing exercise, like, but all the technical debt over here, can we just fix some of that? Like, hey, uh, I got you to click on a link, but we haven't blocked summer 2022 exclamation point in AD using that to, in a dictionary to say, you can't use these types of passwords. We haven't set GPOs that protect customers. We haven't set protect clients, I should say. We haven't done the things that make the bait for the fish not work. You know why? Because that's hard. That's hard to do getting them to click on a link and then say, hey, now go take this 15 minutes of InfoSec training because that's going to change things, right? Interrupting someone's day, alerting their manager, making them take 15 minutes of training that they don't necessarily understand. Is it really going to help? Yeah, maybe. I, mean, I don't want to completely downplay that idea. Any sort of awareness is good, right? But here's what we end with. We run a phishing exercise, they click, and we shame them for clicking. Teams resent security. Teams resent security? Yeah. If you treat them like children and you don't partner with them, they're not going to come to you with problems. So it is safe to return, everyone. Everyone is safe to return. Please feel free to continue hacking the planet and moving around the cabin. We need sustainable fisheries. We need to develop methods and ways to deliver phishing emails inside of our organizations that make people feel like they're part of the solution. They're not a problem that needs to be handled. They're not some kid running around putting their fingers in light sockets and you're saying, oh, don't do that. You know, well, maybe they're an electrician. Maybe that's their job and they know what they're doing and you're just interrupting them. So let's talk about sustainable fisheries in terms that I really love and many people hate. Does, ever, does anyone here know what the PCAOB is? <laughs> I'm sorry, by the way. Um, so the PCAOB is the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. And these are the people that kind of sit between the SEC and these other organizations to say, hey, if you're a big four, because even the big fours, the Deloitte's, the PricewaterhouseCooper, the KPMG, all those folks, even the big four, they still go to someone to say, hey, are we auditing right? And the PCOB is often the people that are delivering that to say, if you're auditing SOX, if you're doing this, if you're doing that, here is how you audit and account for these things. And there's a couple phrases that they look for to say that you are. Is the test you're running accurate and complete, right? And is it effective and repeatable? Like, yeah, you ran it, but if we run it again, will it produce the same outcomes? Yeah, you did this testing, but did you get a good sample of the population? And did you do it in a way that we can say is a complete test? Does any of that sound like somebody clicking on a link and saying, gotcha? No. You're not actually required to do that. You're not required to shame users and make them click on things and say, oh, you got caught by a fish, you naughty child. You're really not. You don't have to. You don't have to, to get results. You do have to figure out how to run an accurate and complete test that you can show auditors and security people that you've thought through the problem. We ran the test this way because we're emulating this threat actor. And we're trying to show our teams and our partners in the organization how they can be attacked without making them feel foolish for clicking on a link. So what it's not, it's not this. I'll tell you that right now. These were big stories in the news. And please don't do this. Derek talked about this. He said he'd give you a very stern look. Uh, I'll probably do something funnier. Um, but I, I wouldn't want Derek to give me a very stern look. He said, if you send phishing emails that use like the pandemic or some sort of FUD, which is fear, uncertainty, and doubt, if you do that, he's like, I'm going to give you a stern look. And you should. You probably deserve it. You deserve someone to sit down with you and say, mm, that's not how we do things here. Right. So GoDaddy did a phishing test that, and, they, and this headline from Engadget says they teased employees 
with a fake holiday bonus. Tribune Media, where I'm from in Orlando, Florida, they run the Orlando Sentinel. They probably also, they're a major conglomerate. They probably run some news source near you as well. Tribune workers got an email dangling a bonus, but it was a phishing exercise. Remember what I said about easy? It is easy during a pandemic when people have lost their jobs, when things are scaling down, when there's this uncertainty about how they're going to do things for their family to send an email to say, hey, guess what? You're getting a bonus. And it looks like it's coming from the company and it's around the holidays. That's easy. Most people are going to click on that, especially if it's coming from your company and it seems contextually accurate. Is that really a valid test? Does it make your users feel good when they find out, no, you're not going to be able to get your kid that gift that they really wanted that you couldn't afford? Oh, and by the way, here's 15 minutes of fishing training to take. Yeah, I know. Everyone's like, because, you know, when you say it like that, clearly, but someone had to authorize this exercise. Look at the templates, look at the emails and say, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I don't know who they were. Hopefully they're not in this room. Hopefully they, you know, thought about their actions later. And also this, this was a very recent, this was in April. And this tweet went out and it, it started to get a lot of traction. When I took that screenshot, it was even more than that. But look at that, 159,000 likes, 1,400 quote tweets. My university sent an email providing a $7,500 hardship assistance for those uh, uh, assistance for those experiencing financial hardship due to the pandemic it turns out it was a phishing exercise when you read that how cold and heartless does that sound all that does is emphasize the idea that people have about our industry that we're people of no that we just want to do whatever we want that we don't listen to rules. And you know what, truthfully, they're probably right. <laughs> because if we listen to rules, we wouldn't poke the box in a certain way. But we're not going to get the outcomes we want until we start empathizing with what we're doing to people. Attackers don't have to worry about that. They don't send a phishing email to the company and go, man, I hope uh, Stephanie in accounting doesn't feel bad about this. It's not part of what they do. They go, oh, I hope Bob over in finance, oh, I, I certainly hope they'll talk to me on Monday because I've got a big project to deliver. They don't have to do that. You do, or should at least. And so I, I you know, made a threat, which seems like it's probably going to come true, where we're going to be tur turning this talk into a, uh, a class on how to run an exercise using pre-tax and delivering this in a way that your people in your organizations that you're charged with protecting feel good about it at the end. What's this? It's what? Blade. It's an exacto blade. Yeah. What, what, what else could it be? Ruler. It, could, it could be a ruler, but there's a reason it's got a ruler on it. Think medical. Scalpel. scalpel. Thank you. It's a scalpel. All correct answers, by the way. But I was looking for scalpel. The reason I have a scalpel up here a doctor can use this, a surgeon can use this to save your life. An amateur will kill you with it, right? I want all of you to be the surgeons, to be the doctors that think about when I make this cut, what's the downstream outcome? If I make this cut, can I go back? Can I back out of it? Can I go a different way if something goes wrong? If you start thinking about the tools you have, the offensive tools, the security tools as scalpels, and you are a surgeon that needs to use them properly and effectively to protect, to heal, to save lives, you will have good outcomes. If you pick up a scalpel and go, the company gave me a scalpel, I'm going to cut stuff. <laughs> You're going to have a bad time. You are going to be these companies that are getting news airtime about being unfeeling, unempathetic, terrible humans. Now, again, I don't want to say that because I'm sure all of us work in a job where management or audit or executives come down and say, hey, we bought this product, we bought this service, we really want to do it. And they have the best of intentions. I'll say that. This is cruel. 
It is cruel. You do not use a pretext. You're 100% right. And we're going to talk about that. And we are absolutely going to talk. It is cruel. And this is the reason I set it up this way. You are right. Cruel is the right word. And we can avoid cruelty. Just in the same way, and the reason I use that sustainable fishing, sustainable farming, there are ways to raise and treat animals so they live healthy lives, even though they end up being a product. So, just like a doctor, if you're a doctor that has a whole bunch of malpractice charges because you broke out your scalpel and you're like uh, Dr. Nick from The Simpsons, and you're like, woo, you're going to go through and cut some people up and, you know, like that kind of thing, you're going to lose trust. You're going to break trust in your organization. And when you break trust, you lose the ability to protect. Anyone here have children? I have four. Okay, well, I'm a good, good chunk of folks. If your kids don't trust you to bring you problems, when you find the problem, is it generally 10x worse to deal with it? Right? But if they trust you to come to you immediately and say, I made a mistake, can you help me? Yeah, it's going to be, all right, I got to go clean up this glass they broke, or I got to go repaint the walls. But instead of them going, okay, well, now I'm going to scrub it with bleach, and that gets on the carpet. And it's like the whole cat in the hat thing where I was like, I'm going to put the dress in the sink. And, the, and suddenly you've got a huge problem. And the huge problem you'll have is that the people that you want to protect won't come to you with problems when you can solve them. Man, you got a sweet click rate, though. Management loves that on the audit slides presented to the board. And we did a thousand hours of security training, which accounted to absolutely nothing. At least nothing measurable, except for the fact that it was delivered. Yeah, maybe there was a few users that said, oh, that looks strange. Maybe I'll go through and click on it. But in my previous talk, I actually give a little campfire story about when I did an exercise. As it was a social engineering exercise at a big multi-billion dollar company. Got everybody in the room, lawyers, compliance, audit, executives, and said, whatever happens, we will be successful. And whoever we're successful against will not be targeted for any sort of punitive, uh, you know, any sort of, uh, what am I looking for? Punishment. The root word, Ian, that was what you were saying. Uh, so they're not going to go through and have any sort of punishment. And you can go hear the rest of that story in the previous talk. But in the end, I came in one day and they were fired. They were fired. And I said, in, in one of my you know, less professional moments, I'm generally pretty good in front of boards and executives and whatnot, but you know, you hit a point at a company where you realize that you just, you're not going to make any change. They're not listening to you. And I storm into an SVP of, I mean, like they were, I think they were on the phone and like, I just go into their office and they're the SVP of this multi-billion dollar company. You don't just barge into their office like that. And I said, what part of nothing punitive was unclear in the exercise? And they're like, hi, Ian. Thank you for stopping by. <laughs> like, it was a little louder and a little more vicious than that. But the whole reason for that story, that person was on the help desk. And within minutes of that person being fired, I started hearing from help desk people, don't talk to, you just through the grapevine. Don't talk to security. They're looking to do things that'll get you fired. You'll lose your job. Don't talk to them. Don't bring them problem. That's terrible. When you lose the ability for people to come to you and say, hey, I was getting these phone calls on the help desk. You know, you're just talking to them over lunch or you're in a cafeteria, you're outside in a smoking area, whatever it is you do where you're having those bumping into people conversations. When you lose that connection, you lose your best source of threat intel. I don't care about CTI, commercial threat intel, MITRE attack framework. If the people on the help desk won't come to you and say, I got a really weird phone call, you're toast. Forget it, you're done. So we lose the ability to protect those people. So the next uncomfortable truth, remember fingers and ears if you're, you know, okay. Everyone can be fished. Everyone, you, me, everyone in this room can be fished. It is time, it is opportunity, it is what's going on in your life, it's contextual. The reason millions of phishing, billions probably, of phishing emails go out from criminals with the idea that maybe if 1% click on them, it will be wildly successful for the criminal is because they know when they send out those millions of phishing emails that whatever pretext they sent, the reason for the email being sent, there's someone sitting at a desk 
having that exact problem at that exact moment. And it seems very real, very contextual, very accurate for what they're doing. You're never going to reduce that number to zero, ever. So again, safe to return. Feel free to start hacking the planet again. Now, what we need to do is build a better lure. We need to make a lure that the fish will bite on, but also doesn't actually leave them feeling as if they're a victim. So some of you may have noticed, I like props. I've got a fishing pole. I don't know how well this is going to work in this room. So I'll bring it back a little bit. I've got something on here. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to try. If I hit someone, I hope we have event insurance. Oh, I got it right to Wolf. Oh. Hold on. I'm trying to get him. All right. I don't want Wolf to get it. Anyone want to go grab that? Thank you, by the way. Go ahead and just tear it off the, the string here. It's on like, you might want to just tear the envelope open. It's okay. It doesn't explode or anything. Perfect. I'm pretty sure. And then if you wouldn't mind, just read the card. Oh, oh, fantastic. Excellent. As it just, they just do everything at this point. So I'll bring this back. Keep the, you can keep the card and the trinkets and everything. So inside of there, thank you for playing along. Inside of there is a B-Sides Orlando challenge coin. You can consider yourself a member of the Order of the Toothy Grin now. And as well, a uh, Adafruit trinket, which is a programmable device. Go see Bill Stearns in Anti-Siphon. He has a code library to turn that into the world's smallest password vault, or uh, there's a bunch of libraries online that you can turn it into like a rubber ducky that you hit a button and it injects keystrokes. So enjoy that and thank you for playing along because I have questions for you. How did you feel opening that? Sad. Sad, why? Thank you, Carl. Well, it is a thank you, Carl. I'm thanking you now, but, but, but at, the end, at the end of it, how did you feel? At the end, you get the little things and whatnot. I'm embarrassed. embarrassed, why? <laughs> Forget the extended warranty part. That was just a joke. Um, but you go through, I pitched that out there. Why would you open it? Seemed like a good idea. Excellent answer. Do you think that I would put something malicious in there while we're doing this talk? Exactly. There's a level of trust, right? I'm up here as the speaker at a conference You've come here, I do something, I throw some random device out into the audience that possibly could take somebody's eye out, and even still, you open it up. Now, enjoy again the, the stuff in there, because I don't want people to feel embarrassed. I want you to feel good about it. You helped people learn a lesson in that I have the trust, and if I don't violate it, and I leave you feeling good, hopefully, I hope, good, and I leave you feeling good, the next time I go to do something like that, you're going to say, yeah, I'll, I'll play along. Let's go. Let's, what am I going to learn today? So build a better lure. And we actually, I jumped ahead here because I was doing hands here. So when I talk about how you made that, how, I, how you felt opening that up, as you build a fishing exercise, I want you to go watch this video if you haven't. And this was in my previous talk. Some of these are carried over, some are not. This is Brene Brown. If you're unfamiliar with Brene Brown, she kind of burst into the scene. She was a researcher that a lot of people knew, and she did a TEDx talk in Houston. You can actually go watch her Netflix special, which I highly recommend, where she talks about the moment that she did this TEDx talk in Houston. And she said, I think I'm going to go out and talk about being vulnerable. And everyone's like, you're going to just go out and talk about being vulnerable. And she said, yeah. And at the time that I took that screenshot, that TED talk, had 54 million views, launched her into the site, guys. She's got a podcast. She got a Netflix special. Just talking about the essential concept of the power of vulnerability. If you make them feel shame, if you make them feel bad, as I hope you don't as you leave this room, you feel good about participating. If you make them feel shame, you lose trust. If you empower your people to be vulnerable, to make a mistake, to click on the link and come to you and say, I think I did something dumb. And you say, no, you didn't do something dumb. You were human. You were busy. You got an email. You got a link. You did your job. 
Now, how can I help you? You gain their trust. You say, well, wait a minute. How do I do that? How do I build a pretext in which criminals would use, but doesn't leave people feeling like a victim? I don't know how to do that. All right, well, let's do it live. I wasn't intending on doing this, but I was sitting in my room earlier and I said, you know what? I think this would be fun. And maybe it was just being a little bit high off the doing the workshop yesterday and saying, I want to get that feeling again. So we'll do it live. Somebody give me an industry or a pretext or a business process, one that you think, hey, you know what? I really need to test this because this is what the attackers are doing. Shipping. Shipping. Okay. So shipping logistics like Big Maersk company or getting your stuff from Amazon? Maersk. Okay. So you're an organization that deals a lot with logistics. You've got container ships going across the ocean and you want to send a phishing email that is contextually accurate that attackers would use, but doesn't leave the person feeling like a victim. Okay. That one I've got a bunch of examples for. You could go through and send an email saying that there's an updated manifest for your containers. You could even include in that email that there are no issues let them know that the updated manifest doesn't have any challenges. However, there have been changes. That would generally be enough for someone who deals in your logistics department to click on that to be like, oh, well, I should probably check what changes happened. But they don't feel like they have to panic. They don't feel like, I better go check that because if something went wrong, you can put right in the email, everything is okay, everything will be delivered on time. However, there have been some changes that you should be aware of. That leaves that person open-minded, it disarms them. They say, okay, let me go check on this. You could also go through and look at things like updates to uh, contractual policies. If you've got someone who you do a bunch of business with, how many of us get emails all the time? We've updated our privacy policy and blah, 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 you should read that. Yeah, we get that a lot. So you could do an email like that where you say, hey, the agreement between this organization and this organization have changed, we need you to review this and give us feedback before we put this policy into effect. What have I just said? I said, nothing's going to change. The policy will change. I want your help. You've already put that into their head. And please give us feedback. Is that going to be as effective as saying, your shipment is late, it won't be on time, there's going to be a fine? Absolutely not. Do I need it to be 100% effective? Also, absolutely not. The people who do this job for a living, the criminals, send billions of emails expecting only to get maybe a less than 1% click rate. Why should you think you would be able to do better when that isn't your full-time job? I don't think so. Anyone else want to throw one out that you've had a problem with or maybe even an industry that you work in? Banking. Banking. Oh, yeah. So all those examples for the privacy and whatnot work as well. But the classic banking ones are always like, oh, we, there's been a charge to your account or we've reset your credentials with banking. Now, are we talking consumer banking or investment banking? Consumer. consumer. OK. So uh, if you're in an organization and you are a consumer bank, uh, I would look at things like, oh, actually, this would be really good. So let's say you're in customer service for banking. Um, I would send emails that look like they're from uh, uh, prospective business clients uh, that are uh, not prospective business clients for me. Don't do that. Uh, that are from clients, business clients or personal consumer clients saying, hey, I have a question. Right. I have a question. I'm taking out a loan and we're closing and I'd really like to understand why this happens. Or I'm interested in some of these other uh, items or transaction options that we have, or I'm curious why this works this way. And when you're doing that campaign, you would look at the groups in your organizations and what they do. So I wouldn't send an email asking, hey, uh, how do I, I, I've got a problem I really think you can help me with. I need to pull archive statements back a couple years because I'm going through an audit I would love your help if you could help me figure out how to get these older archive statements. This is where I went and I clicked here. Do you get the same thing? Do you click? So basically what you're doing is you're reaching out to that person who maybe is involved in that customer service, that business unit, hitting all those groups and saying, hey, we've got a customer. They have a question. I guarantee you somewhere in your banking mission statement, someone wrote up, our job is to serve the clients. You're probably reacting Exactly to that. And more importantly, 
you're not going through and saying, here's a bonus, here's a this, here's a that, because that's easy. But what you are doing is you're writing a pretext that is contextually accurate to their job role. I want all of you to get away from doing the easy route. Take a look at your business units. Take a look at the groups in your organizations and understand what they do every day. And then write the types of pretexts that actually go through and address what they do in a way that is asking them for help. It's not saying you're going to get fired or you're going to do this. It's saying, hey, can you help me? Can you help me do this? Most attackers aren't going to ask you for help. They're going to try and scare you. But you're going to get the same reaction, but in a positive way. If I, yes. I yeah, absolutely. So I, so I don't work in banking. It depends on us. We do a lot of work for banks. Mm -hmm. And we do a lot of phishing, right? So mm -hmm. we're of the opinion mm -hmm. that clicks don't mean anything. Mm -hmm. like, they do not. <laughs> they absolutely they don't. Right. right. So when you're doing your yours, like I, this totally makes sense. Like the more positive versions, mm -hmm. they might be neutral or not negative, right? Right. But are you going as far as being like enter your credits here, download this attachment? Oh, good question. You know what I mean, like, and then using that as part of like an extra yeah. like ten. Yeah, you, you can. Like, yeah, yeah. Is it still considered like evil. No, only if you're causing harm to the person. So think about it this way. Um, so I did an exercise like that where we did credential harvesting, right? But we didn't capture the usernames. And here's the thing. The audit team where I was doing this, they only wanted to know if people would enter in credentials. Now, you could take it a step further as a pen tester. You could go through in your rules of engagement and maybe in your statement of work, it's saying, hey, we want you to go through and try and compromise credentials. But I would then go through with that, that group of people and say, that's fine. Now, mind you, you can't control that organization, but make it very clear to them. If I do this, you may impact their day-to-day -day work. I might end up locking out their account. I may keep them from working. They might get frustrated. Is this something you really want me to do? Now, it might be necessary. You might have to do it. But making sure everyone understands what's going on when you do that, and then also trying to work with them in real time to say, okay, I'm using this user's credentials that I use. Let's make sure they don't get locked out. Let's make sure they don't do this. At that point, you don't have to really do things super on the sly. You can have that IT team with you uh, on the same road. And that person may never know that you harvested their credentials. They never have to feel any sort of shame. They never have to feel anything like that. And then you scrub their usernames from the report so that when it goes out to executives, they go, well, who gave their credentials? We don't know. They didn't tell us. Yeah, that's the hard one. I know. I get it. Uh, yeah, we've had people like they want names that are like, look, I yeah. you know you paid us 25 grand for this, but we don't typically give out. Names. Exactly. So usually they leave it there, but sometimes, of course. You know. Well, and that's the thing. And then you got to decide, and you got to decide, is this a client I want to continue right. working with? I wish that was my decision. Oh, sure. Right. Yeah. Well, then you got to decide, is that a company you want to continue working for? So hopefully you don't work for one of our beloved, you know, groups. So I won't ask. Uh, but Let's get through the rest of this. So how not to train. These are some example emails. I just Googled like phishing emails, right? Or phishing emails, phishing landing, uh, phishing landing pages. Look at the one in the bottom corner. You've been, it's like, dear York, you have been fished. I'm like, come on. Is that the type of thing? Like, yeah, that's that cool old 90s hacker ethos. Like we're so, cool. no, that doesn't work anymore. It never really worked. It was fun, but it never really worked. Instead of doing things like this, what I like to do is we don't need to train people. We, we need to partner with them. And this has been really effective. And, and one of the good things that came out of the pandemic, if there you know, were good things, and, and there were, you have to try and find the bright side of everything, was the unbelievable proliferation of easy to use collaborative online tools. I mean, Zoom basically got out of a massive FTC fine because they kept the economy running. I mean, let's be real, right? Like the judges were like, well, you kind of didn't tell the whole truth about end-to-end -end encryption, but a bunch of industries and jobs didn't collapse because you were like, here's 45-minute meetings you can use for free. In my opinion, that's the truth. 
one of the things that came out of that is there's no shortage of Microsoft Forms, of SurveyMonkey, of this, that, and the other. And I'll build a page that basically asks them, hey, this was a phishing email. And the first thing I'll say is, but that's okay. Everyone can get phished. We would like your help understanding why you clicked on it. Not that you did something bad. And I'll ask questions like, what were you doing at the time? Were you busy? Were you in a meeting? Were you on your mobile device? And you can figure out what those questions are and are what are important to your organization. But and then I remove any shameful language. I say, hey, anyone can get fished. You didn't do anything wrong. A criminal targeted you. Well, not, I mean, sort of. Uh, but a criminal could target you. What did you look for? We immediately assumed that they just blindly went, ah, and they were clicking on everything that came in. And, you know, maybe that's true, but it's highly unlikely. And they might have said, uh, I had a bunch of feedback for some, some exercises where they said, yeah, absolutely. What you sent is something I deal with four or five times a week. It didn't even dawn on me to think about, is this something that, you know, we always tell people, is this something that you don't regularly do? Are you being asked to do something that you don't regularly do? How much time in OSINT, the open source intelligence, would it take to go look at your target company, figure out what they do, do a LinkedIn search to figure out who works there. I should not put my back to the camera. Figure out a LinkedIn search and say, all right, when I target this group, I know they deal with loan processing to go to your banking example. I know they deal with container shipping to go to this and write a pretext that's like what they do every day. Yes, Fred. So this is a lot of a lot of information to ask from users who are already in various situations. So what what do you what would you say to how how would you incentivize them? Oh, that's a great question. So a couple of ideas that I had, and actually it's funny, the challenge coin came up. One of the things I've been pitching internally is making them partners and having little tchotchkes and whatnot that people get to show off. You know, people like tangible things they can hold and they can look at and say, oh, I did a good thing. I helped, right? Challenge coins don't cost much. Um, you can also make sure that they're not punished. Let's start there. Because truth of the matter is you don't get people buying into this until you start actually doing it and they believe you. That's trust. You have to build it, right? So we remove that shameful language and then you ask them to join you. And that's that partner part, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I was, what did you look for? We used to, no, I covered that. Anyway, so will you join us is really the last piece of it. And you say, come become a security champion. Now that you know that you can trust us, that, you, that we're not going to try and get you fired, that we understand that you're busy, that you are also the soul of this company, and I don't get paid unless you're selling, serving our clients, work with us. Help us understand what we can do to make our controls sharper, better, do we need to put DMARC in place? Do we need stronger mobile controls? Because the feedback you get from them when they say, yeah, I was on my mobile phone and I couldn't do, I didn't know how to do the hover over to look at the headers. Like I know to do that, but I didn't, I didn't know how to do it. And I always do stuff on my mobile phone. That feedback is invaluable. It tells you, you've got a controls gap in your mobile environment. You need to go figure out how to make it easier for those users to, to evaluate an email that comes in. They might hear back, come back and say, yeah, I, I saw that it was an external email. I saw this, I saw that, I saw these other things. But I assumed that based on the context and based on it, and it got through that it was something I needed to handle. And if that's the case, you need to go through and figure out how can I take my email system, my email filters, and build better rules to evaluate those types of emails. I, I, the classes I teach, I tell my students, I teach at a school that primarily does gaming and um, gaming and that kind of stuff. So I'll say, and I'll say, ask this crowd, if you're playing a game and a weapon is OP, what do they do? Nerf it. They nerf it. You need to figure out how to nerf the tools that those people need to use. Make them safe to operate. They're going to have to open emails. Try and tell a recruiter they can't open a PDF. You have a good time with that. Um, no, they need to do that. So here's my call to action for you. Yes, Wolf. Before the call to action. Yeah. I love the idea about any way we can grow our security champions program. Mm -hmm. And that, hey, do you want to join us? Mm -hmm. which I think it's so very important. Mm -hmm. What is your success rate? Is that like one in 10, one in 100? How successful is that? So, in a recent exercise, 
I'm not going to, this is going to sound like a lie. It is not. The only question that was asked is as we start our security champions program, and I, I can't go into much more detail than that because it's specific to the org, but I will make it generic for the group here. It was a hundred percent success rate. Really? I'm not kidding. Now, mind you, it was not like hundreds and hundreds of emails because we hadn't necessarily built the trust at that org yet. So the people that did respond, that clicked on the survey and said, let me fill this out and went through the landing page, 100% of them said, I would like to be more involved. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's incredible. And then even as I thought about it, the way it was presented made total sense to me. If someone came to me and said, hey, I will, uh, uh, Derek talked about it in his keynote. He said, I built a little red team club and I brought in the finance people and this and that and the other. Believe, believe it, your job is fascinating to them. Picking locks, hacking stuff. They watch movies. They see James Bond, Jason Bourne, Tom Cruise, whatever. They want to do that stuff. And you do that every day. Tell them that, partner with me. I'll show you how some of this stuff works. If you'll teach me more about your job, they're like, you want to know about accruals? Sort of. I want to know how to protect them. I want to know how to avoid them mostly. All right, so call to action. I want your help. Um, so I put up a GitHub. And those questions that I asked, please put some push requests. Like put a, put a, put a push in and say, hey, I really want to know how I build this pretext. And I'm going to take a stab at building them for you. I'll go through and take a shot. I'll put it back and say, here's a pretext you can use. Here's a landing page you can use. And then we just keep building this stuff. So the next time you run a phishing exercise and you're working on something, you can go back to this library and anything that we've built together, that we've partnered together, you can build. You have a good one that you think matches this framework? Push it to me. Send it to me. Let me look at it and say, wow, this is great. Do you mind if I put this in here? I assume that you wouldn't if you put it into GitHub there. So for the ones that were said here, logistics and banking, uh, probably later tonight as I'm winding down, I might take a stab at going through and putting those in there. And I'll put it into the Discord and say, here's some examples. Give it a shot and tell me what you think. So in summary, people can and will be fished, period. End of discussion. I don't know why that's glitched out there. Oh, it's not glitched out. It's just on my screen. Uh, if you lose their trust, your job will be harder. Full stop. End of discussion. No amount of crazy cool hacks and technical controls are going to save you. Fish without causing harm to relationships. If you harm the relationship between you and your org, it is going to be almost unrepairable. Find ways to partner with them. Gather feedback in an empathetic way. Hey, here's 15 minutes of training because you were so dumb. No, that's not good. And last, you belong here. If you're in here and you're a student or you're, you're like, oh, I'm just in compliance or something like that, man, I'll tell you what, compliance and audit make the world go around. Most of my projects only get approved because audit was like, that's broken. Go fix it. Go figure it out. Go test it. You belong here and we need you. So last couple things here. My Crime is curiosity because we got to go through and you know, reference all the old hacker lore. Now, my career is that of curiosity, and yours is too. Never know. Yes, if. If I leave you with some basic tenants, even outside of here, the security team, it's not no. Be a team of, yes, you can do that. And I'll throw in the context. Because if you don't, we're not a going concern. We're not making money. I don't have a job, and we don't have a business. So because of that, you can do these things if you allow us to deploy this control, if you allow us to make sure that data is encrypted, if you do these things, we can do it. That then starts a conversation. You may even learn something that you didn't know. Well, we can't do that because this is on a legacy environment. I didn't know we had that legacy environment. I better go check that out. All right? And this is one of my favorite phrases. I use it every class, and I end almost every presentation with it. I ask students, and for the sake of time, because I'm right at time, I say, how do businesses make money? And they'll respond back and they'll say, by selling things, by doing services, by this, by that, and all excellent answers and all completely wrong. That is not how businesses make money. Businesses are in the business of taking risks. They lay out capital, they apply wisdom, logic, innovation to it, and they hope by doing that, by taking that risk of putting that capital out, whether it be time, money, blood, treasure, call it whatever you want, 
they hope that they have enough insight, innovation, and competitive spirit, if you will, to deliver that service in a way that they make a profit off of it. But it's all risk. None of it's done without risk, right? So if you go to a company and say, if you don't do this thing, maybe a bad thing will happen. They go, maybe bad things will happen all day long. That's what I do all day as a business person. I look at what bad things could happen and I try and mitigate them. So don't come to me with maybe, come to me with definitely, or come with me with a way to decrease maybe to almost never. And these are my last bit here. You may have noticed the silly shirt that Jason Blanchard hasn't seen me in yet. So Jason, as many of you know, is the community man- is one of the community managers here and just an unbelievable person. He just wrote a book called I Am Whale Man. And whether you're a religious person or not, he has given so much to this community. Just his Twitch channel helped 200 people get into jobs. Yes. I'm one of them. You're one of them. You're one of the people that got a job? Oh, you're one of the people that got a job? Yes. Him? Wonderful. This job. Really? Yes. That's amazing. Awesome. Okay. Go support him. Go buy the book. It's not expensive. I'm not saying you have to go do it, but go do it. This is a person who gives a lot back. So I got his face on here. Deb took this picture while he was on a webcast. Said, I need a picture of you. And he was very confused. And that QR code works. It does take you to the thing. Also, we're running B-Sides Orlando. I won't go into the details of it, but pros hack stuff. They will fail. It'll be fun. It's all like medieval times dinner show themed. Uh, It's all virtual. Definitely go check out the webpage. That is my contact information. The slides are up. Thank you. Wild West Hack and Fest, John, Erica, Velda, sponsors, and my personal maverick, Mr. Jason Blanchard. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Any questions? Stunned silence. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Oh, I'm sorry. Question? Yeah. How do you feel about report metrics as opposed to click metrics? Like, what do you mean by report metrics? We sent this fish out. 50 people clicked on it, but 200 people reported it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, that is 100% the metric you should be looking at. I thought you meant like metrics in a report, but you mean SOC reporting. That is frankly the only metric if you're looking at a real quantitative metric that you should be including. And driving that metric up, whether it's making it easier for people to report, whether it's making it more understandable, that is the only metric you should be tracking because every fish can and will be successful, period. So no, 100% agree. Anything else? Wonderful. Thank you for your time. Very much appreciate it.